there's no question that Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin in 1928 is still one of the greatest contributions to modern medicine. It could have prevented events like the Great Plague of the 17th century that wiped out a quarter of the population of Europe. But now we've entered a different era. We've entered the era of overdiagnosis and overtreatment, what some have called Farmageddon. <laughs> it's estimated that 20 to 50 percent of all antibiotic use is inappropriate, and that's a conservative estimate. And what does that lead to? It leads to increased costs, it leads to increased side effects, it leads to resistance to bacteria, flesh-eating bacteria. But perhaps the greatest cost is something that's a little more difficult to quantify because we can't see it or touch it or measure it. And that's damage to this vitally important community of organisms that cohabitate with us, known as a microbiome, the word on everyone's lips weekend, the M word. So what is a microbiome? It refers to all the microbes that live in or on the human body. And by microbes, I'm talking about bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, those little one cell pests, and all their genes. So we're talking about a lot of microbes. How many? Well, there are more microbes in just the gut alone than there are cells in your entire body. In fact, your bacterial cells outnumber your human cells by 10 to 1, making you more microbe than human, actually, if you think about it. We have known about the microbiome for centuries, from the 1600s when Antony von Leeuwenhoek first described, I think the exact quote was, the little animalculae is very prettily moving in rainwater. But it's taken us about 400 years to figure out that these organisms are actually friends rather than foes, and that the majority of our microbes are not germs that cause disease, but quite the opposite. They're an essential part of our ecosystem, and they're vitally important for keeping us healthy. So many of us struggle or think about what we should eat in terms of maintaining an ideal weight or maximizing our nutrients, but as a list of conditions associated with a microbiome grows to include not just autoimmune conditions in the gut, like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, things like diabetes and obesity, but bipolar disorder and other neurological conditions, as a list gets longer and longer, what we should really be thinking about is what should we be feeding our gut bacteria in order to optimize our microbiome and to keep us healthy. So I'd like to describe three studies to you that I think really make that connection nicely between diet and the microbiome. The first is a Harvard study done last year where they took nine volunteers and they put them on two very extreme diets. The first was a low-carb, high animal protein, sort of Atkins-like diet with bacon and eggs and brisket and salami, and I think it was pork rinds for snacks. And they looked at the microbiome <laughs> before, during, and after the diet. And then they rested the same population of patients, which was a lovely feature of the study, because a lot of these studies have looked at disparate populations that have always eaten differently, but have always lived in different environments, too. So they took the same nine patients, and they put them on a plant-based vegan, di vegan diet of jasmine rice and tomatoes and lentils and squash and fruit instead of pork rinds for snacks. <laughs> and what they discovered was astounding that not only did the bacterial species start to shift, but they shifted incredibly quickly. So within about a day, the species started to change. And we saw on the meat and cheese diet, predominance of the bile-loving species, what we call the bilophilia species, that help to break down fat, but are also associated with inflammation. And not only did the different bacterial species start to shift, but the genes that were activated started to change too. So here was this direct connection that the food you eat determines the bacteria you grow in your gut garden, as I like to call it. And the bacteria turn on different genes. And what do the genes do? They activate disease. So you are what you eat and what your gut bacteria eats, even more importantly. So the second study is a favorite of mine that I actually stumbled across in The Economist, not in the medical journal. And this is from 2010 by an Italian researcher named Paolo Leonetti. And he looked at kids in Florence eating a typical Western diet, high in fat and sugar and processed carbohydrates, lots of gelato and pizza and pasta. And he compared them with a population in Burkina Faso. And what he found was that at birth, breastfed infants in both populations were almost identically the same, or the same, <laughs> were almost identical. Um, but as the babies started to migrate to this sort of, or started to graduate to the typical indigenous diet, 
there were dramatic differences. So the kids in Florence eating the typical Western diet, not surprisingly, had species associated with obesity and allergy and inflammation. And the kids in Burkina Faso eating a very unprocessed plant-based diet, enlivened by the occasional termite, had species associated with leanness and gut health, and they had large amounts of short-chain fatty acids, a substance that is essential for maintaining a healthy gastrointestinal tract. So here again is evidence that the diet, the bacteria follow the diet, not the other way around. I did a study recently in my population. I am an integrative gastroenterologist who came from a typical academic background with lots of prescribing and procedures. And it was really the patients who opened my eyes. A lot of my Crohn's patients were coming in looking great and I would do their colonoscopy and their inflammation had healed and I would say, what are you doing? They said, I changed my diet. And in the 23 years since I graduated from medical school, that was just a, that was a revolutionary thought, the idea that what you eat could actually affect inflammation in your gut. I had never heard that from anyone. In medical school, residency, shocking. And more and more, I started to see people whose inflammation, and I'm not just talking about people subjectively saying, my gas is better, I feel better, but I'm talking about before and after colonoscopy where severe inflammation, ulceration, bleeding, gone, normal. So we embarked on a study. We took 13 patients, nine with Crohn's disease, four with ulcerative colitis, and we put them on something called a specific carbohydrate diet. It's similar to a paleo diet. It basically excludes sugar and processed carbohydrates, and it allows unlimited quantities of fruits and vegetables and some lean protein. And most of the patients notice significant improvement in about six weeks. Of the 13 patients, 12 of them were in remission from the diet. And again, before and after colonoscopy showing incredible differences in their inflammation. So there again, a really clear change of how the diet affects the gut bacteria, how that affects the inflammation. So I, I'm still not 100% sure on what to tell people in terms of what is the ideal diet to cultivate the ideal microbiome so that we can all have optimal health. In my own life, I struggle between being a gluten-free vegan one day and a paleo the other day. I had a lamb chop yesterday. Um, <laughs> so what, what I do know, though, and I think... Michael Pollan's seven sage words, I think, really sum it up the best. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I think we all sort of agree on those ground rules. So we know, or hopefully you know now, that the diet impacts the microbiome. But the microbiome also greatly impacts your diet. So what we know is that obese mice are able to extract more energy from the exact same amount of calories as their lean counterparts, which strikes me as incredibly unjust. It's like low interest rates for the wealthy. I mean, shouldn't the skinny mice be the ones who pack on the pounds instead of the poor obese mice who are already overweight? And to add insult to injury, the skinny mice, the sort of healthy microbiome equivalent, are able to extract more nutrients from the same food. And I see this in my patients with altered gut bacteria all the time, my patients who suffer from what we call dysbiosis, where the whole ratio of good to bad bacteria is off, that even when eating a healthy diet, they really struggle to extract the nutrients and they often end up with nutrient deficiencies. So again, very unfair. In fact, we can predict leanness or obesity with 90% accuracy just from looking at the gut bacteria. And if we take microbes from obese mice and we transplant them to germ-free mice, those germ-free mice gain weight. But if we take microbes from lean mice and we transplant them to germ-free mice, they don't gain weight. So clearly, obesity is much more complex than just the food we eat or genetic factors. And like everything else in life, the microbiome, that's where it's at. So I would like to tell you a little bit about my own microbiome story and how it led to a real awakening about the practice of medicine, or at least how I was practicing medicine. My microbiome story started on March 25th, 2005, at 8 a.m. when I went into labor, and like many women, decided to shave my legs, which has nothing to do with my microbiome story, but just, <laughs> I just, this thing that we do not want to go into the hospital with stubbly legs in case, you know, Sports Illustrated SI turns up or something. So, <laughs> I had my smooth legs as I went into labor, and 16 hours later, when still no baby, I was told it was time for a C-section. So C-sections, which are now one in three births in the U.S., 
bypass a critical early step in the maturation of the child's immune system, and that is colonization with the mother's vaginal microbes. So that simple act of traveling through the birth canal and swallowing a mouthful of microbes is an incredibly important event. You thought it was the bar mitzvah or the first year of college, it's that event, <laughs> because what we know is that babies born vaginally are colonized with lots of good bacteria, with lactobacillus and all the other sort of desirable species. And C-section babies, like my poor daughter, are colonized with staph and hospital-associated bacteria. Not so great. And not just that, but these benefits continue long after you leave the hospital. So what we see is that babies born vaginally lower rates of asthma and allergy and inflammation compared to C-section babies. So in addition to sort of coming through the zipper across the abdominal wall instead of out through the JJ, uh, my daughter <laughs> received my daughter received two doses of very strong intravenous antibiotics at birth. Not because she was sick, but because I'd had the flu and a fever, and the doctors decided, just in case, let's put her in the neonatal ICU, let's give her some strong antibiotics. And at the time, I thought this was great. I thought, oh, these doctors are so careful, and they're giving her antibiotics just in case. They're really on top of it. When my daughter, Sydney, was about six months old, she developed a fever and a sore throat, and we had the first of what would be many, 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 many visits to the pediatrician. And each month, she just seemed to get sicker and sicker, and the doctor would open the chart and say, okay, well, what was she on last time? We'll give her this this time. What really began to concern me was that nobody seemed to be paying attention to the amount of antibiotics she had been receiving. Each month, it was just a different antibiotic. I hadn't yet had my personal awakening, if you will. I still wholeheartedly believed in the superiority of modern medicine, the omniscience of the doctor, and the seductive simplicity that illness equals antibiotics. But does it? So two-thirds of all visits to the doctor for respiratory tract infections result in a prescription being written for an antibiotic. Of those visits, 80% of them do not even come close to meeting the CDC guidelines for requiring an antibiotic. The majority of, viral, the majority of air infections in children are viral, but they are still prescribed antibiotics, which not only do nothing to hasten the recovery, but they increase the risk of side effects of things like rashes and diarrhea. So as this cycle of illness and antibiotics and doctor visits continued, something happened one day that really made me rethink my whole approach and what I was subjecting my child to. My daughter had a cough and a cold, and we were getting ready to travel, and my husband said, oh, I'm going to take her to the doctor. And I said, well, I'm not going. I'm boycotting. They walked in the door from the doctor's visit with my daughter carrying a nebulizer machine for asthma, with stickers, of course, and four prescriptions, an antibiotic, a steroid, an antihistamine, and a bronchodilator. I went to my little filing area, I'm an obsessive filer, and I pulled out the wad of pharmacy studs, 15 rounds of antibiotics and 50 visits to the doctor, more than I had had in my entire life, and she was not yet in kindergarten. And that's when I said, I'm done. I said, there, there's got to be some other way to do this. And so we just stopped going to the doctor. Now, I am not advocating in any way that you stop going to the doctor. <laughs> Say that again. Nor am I advocating that you stop taking your child to the doctor. But I am advocating that you become that kind of patient, the kind who asks the pointed, uncomfortable questions, like whether 15 rounds of antibiotics in a toddler is a good idea, or whether there are alternatives, or what if you just did nothing and toughed it out? I am absolutely advocating that. So the fascinating thing, and probably not surprising to all of you, is that as we stopped going to the doctor and she stopped taking antibiotics, she actually got better. In the beginning, she was still pretty sick. Her good gut bacteria had been so depleted by the ons uh, onslaught of antibiotics from birth that in the beginning, she had trouble fighting even a simple viral infection. But as she got stronger and her gut bacteria improved and I got more kale into her, she got healthier. And today she is a healthy nine-year-old who definitely eats more kale than her demographic, but probably <laughs> eats exactly the same amount of cookies. So there you go. <laughs> so I'd like to tell you a little bit about what is called the hygiene hypothesis. I don't love the term, it's not a term I coined, it's a term in the medical literature, because it makes it sound as though people in poorer countries are less hygienic, but that's what it's called. And 
what it suggests is that in poorer countries where, let's say there's less sanitation, I think is maybe a nicer way to put it, where there's dirtier water and there's more exposure to germs and parasites and things, there's far less autoimmune disease. So if we look at a map of the world and we look at something like Crohn's disease, very prevalent in Western Europe and in North America and virtually non-existent in Sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia, but as countries get more industrialized and cleaner, and we're seeing this in the Middle East and India, the rates of autoimmune diseases like Crohn's and lupus and MS start to skyrocket. So as we unwild our bodies and our societies and our food, we decrease our bacterial diversity and we weaken our immune system. And how ironic that in these poor countries that we sort of look down on, they actually have it going on in terms of the microbiome. So food for thought. Our modern practices, our zeal for cleanliness, our hand sanitizer everywhere, our antibiotic for every sniffle, our scheduled C-sections, our processed shelf-stable food that never expires have made us so sick. We are so removed from the natural world of animals and dirt and plants, and we have really super sanitized ourselves into this position. And now we're paying the price. So I'd like to leave you with some ideas for how we can put the super clean genie back in the box, so to speak. How we can get back to a dirtier, healthier way of life so that we can create this, we can grow this amazing gut garden and be super healthy. So I think less drugs is obviously a huge part of it. Not just antibiotics, but other drugs that are detrimental to the microbiome, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, hormones, steroids, things like that. So judicious use of drugs is key. The second is more dirt. I, for one, have not showered since I have been here. I just did a little, you know, dab, dab situation, and you can, you can, you can come and take a whiff later and tell me what you think. But um, there, there's actually somebody who founded one of these um, biome companies who apparently has not showered in 12 years, and I am dying to meet him and to take a good, you know, check out all his nicks and crannies and see what's going on. But apparently, <laughs> apparently he's super healthy. So, so definitely more dirt is really important. And more plants. And, you know, whether you're a vegan, gluten-free vegan, paleo, whatever, I think we all agree more plants. And if you can grow them yourself and get a little dirt under your fingernails, all the better. So I was thinking about this concept and something struck me that what we need to grow our own good gut garden is exactly the same thing we need to grow a real garden. It's less chemicals, it's less sort of pesticides and things. It's dirt and it's plants and maybe some animals to help with the composting. So get a dog and have him lick you. So exactly the same thing. So I would like to leave you with my four simple words for how to optimize your microbiome, and that is live dirty, eat clean. Thank you so much.